welcome. This is our the Midpoint Library's first inaugural tour. Uh, at this point, we're going to be touring Middletown Cemetery, also known as Middletown Historic Pioneer Cemetery and the Pioneer Cemetery. My name is Erica. I'm a reference librarian at Midpoint Library's Middletown branch. And on this fine October morning of 2019, I'll be showing you around the cemetery, talking about some of the people who are buried here, the symbolism, the stone types, and the history of the cemetery and how it reflects the history of the town. The cemetery was known as the Pioneer Cemetery because the oldest settlers in this area are buried here. Despite its age, though, this is not the oldest cemetery in Middletown. That honor went to what was called Old Middletown burial grounds. They were over by the Great Miami River. The first interment there was in 1798 when a hunter was supposedly mauled by a bear and died. The community recognized the need for a cemetery and began one in that location. Burials continued there, but there was a flood in 1802 that partially washed out that cemetery, and folks recognized the need for a cemetery in a more sustainable location. Daniel Bodie, this gentleman here, donated four acres of his land, farmland, in this location for a new cemetery, and thus began Pioneer Cemetery. He did this in 1827. The original land was four acres. Some of the burials in this cemetery predate 1827 and may have been relocated from the old cemetery. Whether they moved the bodies or just the stones, don't know. This is a map of the original purchase. The four acres were divided into 10 squares, squares one through 10. Squares one and two are not shown on this map. They're the green areas that were left up as a buffer to the road. Squares three through six have 26 slots each, and squares seven through 10 have 13 lots each. Square 10 was considered the potter's field, where those who could not afford a more premium burial were able to buy plots. This area holds the founders, the movers, and shakers of the early Middletown community. They were the first folks to arrive in this area and their immediate children. Starting here at Daniel Doty's family plot, Daniel Doty gave the land for the cemetery. He was also the first permanent white settler in the area. He was born in New Jersey in 1765. He joined the Ohio militia for the Revolutionary War in 1790 and traveled through the area. He came back in 1791, bought land, and built a cabin. He left to get his family, and when he returned in 1796 with his wife and children, they found the cabin had been washed away by the river. They built a new cabin. At that point, he anchored the settlement here. He had encouraged his former New Jersey neighbors to join him, and by 1797, the settlement included Enoch, Van Ness, Potter, Fales, and other settler families. Another early family was the Heatons. David Heaton, here, was a Revolutionary War vet, just like Daniel Doty. He was born in New Jersey in 1742. He came to Middletown in 1802 at the age of 60. He served as postmaster for several years. He died in Middletown in 1839 at the age of 96. This is James Heaton, David's son, who brought him to the area. James was born in an area of Virginia that became West Virginia. He was born in 1779. He moved to Middletown in 1802 at the age of 23. He was very active in the community. He hosted Baptist meetings at his cabin starting in 1808 until their church was built in 1811. This church became Salem Baptist and eventually became First Baptist. He was a surveyor. He laid out this cemetery. He also laid out the town of Oxford and Miami University 
in 1809. He was a charter member of the Jefferson Lodge of the Masons, which formed in 1827. His son, David, was a lawyer who moved to North Carolina and was elected to the U.S. Congress. James died in Middletown in 1841 at the age of 62. These are the graves of the Reverend James S. Grimes on the right in the pale stone and his wife Elizabeth on the left. The Reverend Grimes was born in 1760 and is reputedly a Revolutionary War veteran. He was the first minister residing in Middletown. He arrived in the fall of 1805, where he immediately started to meet with his congregation in his log cabin. He was ordained in the Methodist tradition in 1815. Professionally, he was a carpenter and was said to have rebuilt the stairway in the U.S. Capitol building after it was born, burned in the War of 1812. You'll notice the repairs to Elizabeth's stone. There is ongoing maintenance occurring in the cemetery. Some of the tombstones have only an abstract pattern. In this cemetery, that pattern tends to repeat and was either commonly available or a craftsman at the time specialized in that pattern. You'll notice on James Heaton's stone that this is a commissioned stone with a custom carving. He has surveying tools in a window behind a drape. That drape generally represents the separation between life and death between the sacred and the profane, and supposedly references the veil between the public areas and the priest's areas in ancient temples. Our next symbol are these inverted torches. When tor torches are inverted, they're typically dipped in water and snuffed out. The fact that these torches are still lit is a representation that despite death, Life is eternal. This pedestal is topped with an urn and a drape. The urn in the Victorian era represented the earthly body, the vessel in which the soul had been deposited. It references back to early burials, which were generally cremations. The drapery, once again, references the separation between life and death. Tombstone symbolism was very important in the Victorian era, but the use of these symbols diminished over time and their meanings have largely faded. Sometimes though, the symbols are just pretty pictures. These two tombstones are the same basic type of tombstone. They are for Civil War veterans, and you can see that they are not on any sort of a base. So this tablet has sunk just a little bit into the ground. But the one identical to it, that's right here, has sunk considerably. When there's no base underneath a tablet stone, the weight tends to cause it to sink, and some information may be lost under the ground. The most common shape, the iconic shape, in a cemetery is what is commonly called a tablet. This tablet is directly on the ground, and that will often be prone to sinking into the ground and losing information at the bottom. This is a tablet on a base. This helps to protect it against sinking. This little guy here is a rounded top uh, corner marker for a family plot. So it's just a corner post. This is a monument. This one happens to be a granite one with a cap and die on base. And the monument will not be for an individual. It will be for a family. The individuals will be indicated by these individual stones. So these markers are for each individual within the family. These are a bevel or slant type stone through here. And they're in matching granite. So that helps you to understand uh, the relationship between the monument and the individual markers. The banker family plot is a fairly typical representation of the family plot. There is a central monument with the family name. There are corner markers, in this case very prominent markers, at all four corners. In this case, the ground is also raised within the family plot. 
the monument in the center does have Mary Ann, the wife, Solomon, the husband, and the names and death and birth dates of the children on it. Nonetheless, this is a family monument. The individual markers are these small tablets arrayed off to the side. This marker belongs to Joseph Loomis. It's in a nice sandstone and it's a beautiful condition for its age. He died in 1836. He is our third confirmed Revolutionary War veteran in the cemetery. Aside from that, it's got some beautiful decorations. The schoolwork here is commonly repeated within this cemetery. The other symbols that you can see on here is the archway, which represents the entrance to heaven, the weeping willow, which represents mourning, and the sarcophagus that represents the dead. So we have an entrance to heaven and perpetual mourning for the deceased. Right next to him is his wife's stone, same sandstone, only a couple of years older than his. You can see it has exactly the same pattern and the same carving here, but the text and the carving are considerably less clear. This stone is tilted ever so slightly backwards, which has exposed the face to acid rain, which became a problem starting in the 1970s as a product of industrialization. This stone here for Harriet Van Ness is a special shape that has its own name. It is called a tympanum, and it will typically come up and have some kind of a cap, a very distinctive arch in the middle, and then another cap on the far side. In addition, this stone has some beautiful work on it. It has a vine along the perimeter. It has a pair of wheels in the cap. And inside of this central space, we have a lit lamp that generally represents the eternal soul or knowledge, and then a beautifully rendered weeping willow that comes up from the left and drapes down on the left and the right to represent mourning. This is the stone of Stephen Vale. It was originally a full column, as you can see. In this case, the column was broken when the stone fell. It's been partly re-erected, but not repaired. There are many symbols in here. I know they're hard to see. They're kind of blurry because of the wear on the stone. There is an angel here. He's standing, and you can see his wings behind him. You can see a person here with their arms, their hands clasped in prayer. There is a column right here, which has been broken off, and the top of it is sitting in this location. The column that is broken represents a life cut short. Here you have three links of a chain. That is a symbol of the IOOF, the Odd Fellows. Another symbol of the Odd Fellows is right here. It is a palm, the hand is facing you, so there's the thumb and the fingers are up here and the wrist, and it has a heart within it. This particular Odd Fellows symbol represents generosity. This stone belongs to Colonel B. A. Enyard. He died in 1867. It's a beautiful stone. One of the main things that you'll notice, though it's a little bit hidden, is the shield shape that comes down here. This is actually the Civil War veteran's shield. He was most likely a colonel in the Civil War. But rather than using the federal monument, these guys sprung for a custom one. They did incorporate the shield to indicate his involvement in the war, however. There is this beautiful wreath that represents victory and death. A star, which is often an indication of Masonic affiliation, though that may or may not be the case for this gentleman. I'm not sure. There is a triangle inside of that with an acorn in the very center. The acorn generally represents a kernel of knowledge or faith that would eventually become a massive, sturdy oak tree of knowledge or faith. Here we have some additional marker shapes. These are rounded raised top stones. In the foreground, then, we have rectangular raised top stones. The roadway that we're on is the center of the original purchase. It divides lot three, square three, excuse me, on our left 
So the square of four on our right. And then we've got a crossing path with square six now on our left, the main roadway and square five on our right. It is divided by this old roadway from square three. This is the only example in Middletown Cemetery of a tree trunk grave marker. The broken tree, just like a broken column, generally indicates a life cut short. The gentleman in this case was John Gentry. He died in 1870 at the age of 57 years old. Twined around the tree trunk is a vine of ivy. On this lopped off branch is several Masonic symbols. We have the compass with the G inside of it and a Christian cross. Around the other side, right in this area, we also then have a bunch of oak leaves with acorns, again representing strength and the growth of knowledge or faith from seed to the mighty oak. This small building is the mausoleum, also sometimes called the receiving vault. These small buildings and old cemeteries used to house the bodies of the dead who died in the winter time. Back when graves were dug by hand, they could not often be dug if the ground was frozen. So the bodies would be effectively refrigerated in these small above ground buildings until spring thaw. This one was built circa 1870 in order to store the bodies. In 1878, the city did some improvements, including closing in the windows and building racks or crypts within the building. People had to pay a daily rent for the crypt for their loved one. In 2011, the stonework was repaired, and in 2016, the roof was replaced and the patio built. The Middletown Cemetery Board had gotten the grant from the Middletown Community Foundation for these restoration projects. At the other end of this pathway, there was built at the same time a circular pond with a Victorian fountain. That pond was filled in sometime before 1945. The pathway between the mausoleum and the pond represents the border between the very oldest section in the cemetery, square three of the original purchase, 1827, and the very newest addition to the cemetery, the Harnish or Northeast edition. This edition was made sometime before 1895. Originally two house lots, this addition had belonged to the cemetery for a while, but they had not used it for graves. They sold part of this addition to the lumber company, leaving only an acre and a half of land. Originally, the Harnish addition came all the way down here to the fence line for this whole depth. When this was sold off to the lumber company, you ended up with lots one through 42 remaining. Newer stones, rather than having Victorian symbolism, will often have images that were meaningful or attractive to the deceased or their relatives. Gravestones will often tell stories, though you'd want to confirm any of these stories with historical resources where possible. Here we have the gravestone for the monument for Henry and Eliza May. Eliza May died in 1916. Henry, despite being born in 1855, has no death date. This may be because he remarried and is buried with his second or third wife. It could be that he moved out of the area before his decease. In addition to that monument, we have a grave marker for mother and none for father. The back of the lumber company represents the border between the Harnish addition to the north and the east addition. The east addition houses the newest interment. This grave was filled two weeks ago. 
the east addition is the largest single portion of the cemetery. It was added in 1869 and is five acres. Along the north side of the east addition is the harnish addition. This dashed line is where the building lot for the lumber company comes right up to the property line. The rest of this, there are graves in this area and then a large area of graves over here. The concentric circular plan and radiating pathways remain visible in the landscape. Though many of the paths no longer exist, there are raised areas where the paths used to be that are clear of stones. The stones themselves remain in this radial pattern. There are large areas of this section with no stones. The competing cemetery, Woodside, was opened in 1891 and achieved the large open park-like ideal of the time. Many of these areas with no stones were the burial locations for the people of color from the community. Folks in this area were generally from the Great Migration, coming from the Deep South for industrial jobs. The area toward the back in this direction is primarily where individuals from the Northern Migration who came from Virginia and Kentucky for farming. Because there's no marker now doesn't mean that there never was a marker. In addition to the fact that these people were loved and remembered, many of them were marked with homemade stones made out of concrete, metal, and wood. Wood markers no longer exist in the cemetery. Two of the men who came as part of the Great Migration, either brothers or cousins, were Amos and Samuel Henry. They were born around 1830, black, in Kentucky, when that was a very dangerous thing to be. They joined the Union side in the Civil War and are veterans. Following the war, they moved to Middletown to exercise their freedom. While Samuel died shortly after moving to Middletown, his wife Sarah and their children and Amos and his family were very active in the community. Amos gave land for the church that became the Second Baptist Congregation. These are the only stones that remain from the Henry family. They're likely Samuel's daughters. We're now at the intersection of three additions. The original purchase is north of this drawing here. East of it is the east edition that we were just in. What we have here is the south edition. It's arranged in ranges and lots, just an axial numbering system. It was acquired in 1863 and is two acres large. The difference between the sections is visible on the ground. The original purchase has a very tight rectilinear layout with no pathways between the lots. The south addition has a looser rectilinear layout and does have narrow pathways between the lots. In contrast, the eastern addition has the concentric circular layout with the graves oriented perpendicular to their nearest path. The pathways there are large and curving. Square 10 of the original purchase was the potter's field. This area is now largely bare of markers. Whether the markers were made of uh, temporary materials, if they were of poor quality and did not last, if they've been lost, or if the family simply could not afford a marker at the time, very few markers remain in this area of the original purchase. These two adjacent stones have beautiful examples of doves carved into them. This is the stone for Gilbert Doty. It's the only natural stone, tombstone, that's in the entire cemetery. If you contrast this with his grandfather, Daniel Doty, whom we saw at the beginning of the tour, you'll see that tastes changed quite a bit. These three adjacent stones are his wives.
this stone has the classic example of an upward pointing finger indicating the ascension to heaven of the deceased. This stone for Mary, wife of John, is the only anchor in the cemetery. This stone for Hermann Rotman is in German. It has a central cartouche inside of the Civil War shield. The gentleman died in 1862, aged 24 years, nine months, and 25 days. This area of the South Edition is called the Veterans Lot. It was donated in 1890 by the Cemetery Association for any veteran who could not afford his own grave. It is once said to have had a 14-foot tall monument to unknown soldier. This stone has quite an elaborate story to tell. It is the stone of Jacob A. Snyder, and it is full of symbols. There are roses on it. They are completely open, and there are two roses entwined with each other. The fact that they're completely open generally means that the individual lived to maturity and old age. The fact that there are two roses together would generally mean eternal love with his partner. There is an open book, which often will refer to either knowledge or the Bible, and an upward pointing finger. The lettering itself for Jacob Snyder is on a scroll, which often represents the life as it unfolds. And all of this is situated under an archway representing the gateway to heaven. This stone has an inset carving of a lamb. Lambs may have been used to refer to Jesus, the Lamb of God, but they were very frequently used in the Victorian era to indicate a child or infant. Across from it, this stone has an elaborate carving of a person leaning against a broken tree trunk. Again, that broken trunk indicates a life cut short. This tablet style stone was set on a base, but it has broken that base, so it's straight into the ground. 